Okay, I'm on. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Okay, let's wait for the pe uh, people to come in. Oh boy, technology. Okay, we're going to continue where we left off. At least praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The first 37 minutes got saved. We didn't lose anything. I don't have to repeat myself, right? Praise the Lord Jesus for that. I don't have to repeat myself. So this is now part 2B. Part 2, at least the 37 minutes was preserved. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I don't have to repeat myself, okay? We'll just wait for the people to show up. What happened? Uh, David Wood had problems too. Did he shut down? Right? Did he shut down? I know. Haterwood has, uh, like I said, he cures insomnia. Oh, he's still alive? Tell that hater to get off because you're boring as pits. Okay. All right. Slander to Haterwood. Okay. Okay. We just got to wait for a few more faces to show up by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully they get the notification. I don't know what happened. Yeah, actually, yeah. Not to see his face is a blessing. If you want to taste the purgatory, just keep him look, keep looking at his face. You know, one time I said, "Hey, Dave, is your face hurting you?" He goes, "No, why? Because it's killing me." All right. Okay. I'm just waiting. All right. Well, I guess we lost most of the crowd. Hopefully, they'll come back on. Hopefully, they'll come back and let me let them know. Let's see. All right. Invite the people to come. All right. Let's see. All right. We're going to have to continue where we left off. Too bad, man. We lost everybody. All right. Well, then that's fine. If you guys are still held, I'm going to finish the point because I want to finish 1 Corinthians 14. Yeah. We were up to about 120. We're down to 20. That's okay, Nathan. Let's just continue. Okay. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's continue. Let people know that I'm back on. Okay, where I got cut off was the point I was making. Let me repeat it again. Okay, let me repeat it again. <clears throat> though the Bible is for us, okay, though the Bible is for us, okay, let me repeat this point. I want it to sink in. I want you to get it, okay? Though the Bible is for us, it wasn't written to us, right? Hey, I'm back, Andrew. So we're going to continue where we left off. So hopefully everyone come back in. Though the Bible was written for all Christians in all generations till the end of time, when it was originally written, these books were written for, or I should say to, see the words four and two. Lord Jesus, anoint this session, fill us with the Holy Spirit, save us from the evil one, crush his head under your glorious feet, Lord Jesus. All right, let me try it again. I'm, I'm still upset the fact that we lost internet connection, but that's fine. Okay, now, let me repeat the point. Even though the Bible is for all Christians and all generations till so the Lord Jesus returns, these books were not written to us. They're written to specific communi communities at specific locations at specific times with specific needs. So if you want to better appreciate 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, Better appreciate. So now let's refocus by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus as he fills us to glorify him and to be in love with him because he's worthy. We love you, Lord Jesus. Okay. If you want to better appreciate 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, what it means and what it doesn't mean, then what we need to do is see who the intended audience happens to be and why Paul is even mentioning and raising and addressing these issues. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, 1, so that this point sinks in. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, so that this point sinks in. Pay attention to this. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. I don't know why you put five, Protestant believer. Protestant, maybe I know you had a hard time in kindergarten. One is before five, before four, before three. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Pay attention, folks. I need you to read this passage. Post it one more time because I want people to get it. I want people to get it. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Notice what Paul says. One more time. 
Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, did you guys catch it or did it go over our heads? Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Do you see the context? Paul is saying, you Corinthians, the church at Corinth wrote to me a series of questions. And now I'm answering those questions. And obviously by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you see the point? He's addressing questions, challenges, issues, plaguing a church at that time at a location called Corinth. So if you don't understand that he's responding to questions, questions of which we don't have, but we can get an idea and clue what those questions were. Do any of you have that letter that the Corinthians wrote to Paul with their questions and issues and challenges? Does anyone have it? Does anyone have that list of questions, that letter? Of course not. So what does this tell you off the bat? What does this tell you off the bat? First Corinthians was written to address the questions, the issues, the concerns of a particular Christian group living at a particular time in a particular location. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, right, has an historical context. He's addressing a situation plaguing that church at that time. Is that making sense? Is that making sense? Are you with me there? So when I want to understand what 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 is all about, I have to take into consideration this, this is addressing a particular group of Christians, a particular group of women living in a particular location at a particular time. And then once I properly understand his point, what he means and what he doesn't mean, then I can see how it applies to Christians in the 21st century by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Brother Bass, you're not saying anything I didn't just say. So I don't know why even the need to say it. Is that clear? Is it making sense? Do you want to make sure before I move on so we can finally settle the issue of the roles of males and females, male believers and female believers in a mixed congregation that is supposed to... <clears throat> comply with God's prescribed will for how the church is to be structured and how the church is supposed to worship the Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Another example. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 26. Send Diamond Heart on it. Distract. Okay. Let's read. 1 Corinthians 7, 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that is good for a man so to be. He's addressing an issue that doesn't concern us today necessarily. He's addressing an issue about whether virgins who were betrothed should be married off or should they remain virgins and not get married. And then he says, in light of your present distress, what distress? In light of your present crises, the tribulation that you're undergoing, it's more fitting and better for you not to get married. What distress? What crises? Right? What tribulation? What virgins? You see, this is not written to you. Is it making sense? You understand? It's not written to you. So 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 is not written to you. It's written to those Christians who had particular issues and problems and he's addressing. But it does have meaning for us today. For example, here's the principle you can extract from 7, 25, 26. If Christians are living in a time where they're being persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, and killed, in light of that, it's easier for a Christian not to get married because when you get married, it may add, add to the burden of remaining a faithful witness to Christ because it's easier as a single man.
to be willing to die for Jesus than it is to be a father and a husband and then have someone threaten me that they're going to kill my children before my eyes if I don't deny Jesus. You get my point? So that's what Paul is saying. In light of your situation, in light of your crises, in light of your issues, it's best you don't get married because it'll be easier for you to suffer tribulation and endure persecution without caving into temptation to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So now this passage would have meaning for Christians in China. It would be applicable for Christians in Iraq, in Syria, who are being tortured, imprisoned, beaten, enslaved, and or murdered or raped. You get it now? You understand the point? And this is not the only time where God spoke through an inspired emissary instructing individuals, in light of your situation, it's better you remain celibate and single. God told Jeremiah the very same thing. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. I hope this is blessing you, educating you, helping you understand the scriptures with greater depth by the power of the Holy Spirit and appreciate more as we fall more passionately in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 16, verses 1 to 4. Okay. Jeremiah 16, verses 1 to 4. The word of Jehovah came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife. Notice, a celibate prophet. So the word told Jeremiah, You will not take a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place, Jerusalem. For thus saith Jehovah concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, right? And concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. Do you see what God is doing? Jeremiah, I'm going to spare you the pain, the heartache. Because my people's sin are so great, I'm going to bring in nations headed by the king of Babylon to destroy the city and the temple and destroy its inhabitants. So I want to spare you from the pain of seeing your wife and children killed before your eyes or dying of famine. Is everyone getting this? Is it making sense? Just before I move on. Now, does that mean this instruction for Jeremiah or the instruction that Paul gave to the Christians in Corinth that virgins don't get married, men remain celibate, is applicable for all Christians at all times? Joa, if you actually say that again, it's a different covenant, you know I'm going to block you, right? Don't insult me and make these stupid comments. What does a different covenant have to do that it's the same instruction in both covenants? See, these Christians who keep pontificating, God have mercy on us, and Lord Jesus forgive us. Okay, Clear, right? Okay. If that is clear and it makes sense, we're going to re-examine 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 again. Is it clear thus far? Is it making sense thus far? Send Joa on his merry way. This man is not here to learn but pontificate because he thinks he's intelligent. Send him on his way. All right. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. Come on, first last. Send him on away, my brother. Okay, let's read. Now let's see if you catch it. Pay attention. Let's see who's going to catch it. Pay attention. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I don't know how many of you caught it. Even if you want to take this passage to mean women cannot say anything at all in any circumstance or situation, 
It's referring to a specific group of women. Who caught it? Let's see who catches, who's paying attention and studying the scriptures with depth. No, not under the law. You're not catching it, Zarina. Pay attention. No, not your women. Come on, it's right there. Let's see who's going to catch it. This is why you guys got to read. Thank you, Billy. It's talking to married women. That means at most you're proving that only married women should be silent, not unmarried ones. You catch it? So even this passage in its context is not speaking of all kinds of women. It's speaking of a specific group of women, married ones. You see the point? Did you catch it? So the most this passage proves is that married women should be silent. So you guys are not reading carefully. Yep, Buchim, a promise in the Old Testament is not applicable for you unless the New Testament confirms it is. Okay, Buchim. Did you catch it? So the most you prove from 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, the most is only married women should be silent. But even then, that's not his point. Well, Sylvia, it's not what you see. It's what the text says. What does the text say? Let them ask their husbands at home. So he's not talking about all women or women in general because women are not married. Who are they going to ask? Because he's not addressing that. He was addressing disruptive wives who are creating chaos, confusion, and division in the church because they're promoting disorderly conduct in the church. Now, Brother Bass, I'm going to give you a chance not to get blocked. What about the unmarried woman? Most, not all. Are you saying that what I'm saying is wrong? If so, most means there are still women not married. What are you saying? Because I'm going to block you. Because I'm getting tired of you, to be honest with you, brother. Sorry. Let me see if this guy is trying to be a smart aleck and know it all. Sorry about that, guys. People are not learning there. Listen, sorry, because you got too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Because can you explain to me why that comment was necessary that most women were married? When we just read in 1 Corinthians 7, there were many virgin girls at that church who are not married yet in 1 Corinthians 7. Brother Bass, answer quickly because I'm going to bounce you. I don't have time for fools and idiots. I'm sorry, Christians, if I offend you, go somewhere else. Yep, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Quickly, you got less than a minute. Leave and don't come back because I'm going to muzzle you again. Okay? Folks, if you want to benefit from the channel, stop pontificating. Stop trying to pretend to be smart. Stop trying to show off that you know Scripture because you're going to embarrass yourself and you're going to be shown that you don't know Scripture. And I'm not one of those guys that won't muzzle you and embarrass you. I'm going to treat a fool according to his folly. Get lost. Get out of here. Lord Jesus, have mercy and forgive us all. Okay? Did you guys remember in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul was talking about virgin girls who are betrothed to get married? And he says to those virgin girls that it's better they don't get married in light of their present crises. Right? So what point did it serve for this idiot to tell me most women were married? We love you, Lord Jesus. Crucify our flesh. Destroy our flesh and fill us with the life of the Spirit. What purpose did it serve? Right? Don't you love my style of teaching? I'm going to go for the juggler and give you a taste of your medicine, or I'm going to love on you. Right? Okay. So, is it clear that the very most that this passage proves, the most that this passage proves, is that he's addressing married woman? So, he leaves the issue of unmarried woman open. So, right there, you're learning how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible. No, House Junkie was actually complimenting me. See, folks, we need more people like me who are not wishy-washy, effeminate teachers, but will be in your face and put you in your place when you need to be put, because that's how the apostles and prophets were. Right? 
Praise our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why I won't be popular. I won't get too many people. And I'm going to be struggling most of my life. <laughs> we love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus. Okay. So far making sense. If there's someone confused, let me know. I'm confused. If you're not, then I'm going to explain what Paul meant and didn't mean. Yep. It's not for effeminate Christians, MC Lightning. Okay, everyone clear? So I can move to the next point. Now, with that said, we're going to read now the context. Man, my internet's not. Oh, it's working. Okay. Hopefully it's working now. Oh, my. Yep, it's okay. With that said, we're going to read the context. Now let's start. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 36. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 36. Yeah. The only the only time Jesus is Lord, I'm an alpha male is when it comes to preaching. Outside of that, man, I'm not even a beta male. Boy, do I struggle with confidence issues. By the way, honest confession. You may think I'm just saying it. People think I'm very confident and aggressive like an alpha male. No, that's because the Holy Spirit emboldens me and gives me the grace to be bold for the glory of Jesus. Outside of that, psh, boy, whew, boy, do I like confidence. But anyway, it's all about Jesus Christ. Let's read. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 36. Let's read. Read with me. How is it then, brethren? Pay attention now, the context. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine. Every one of you has a psalm that they want to sing, has a teaching they want to share, hath a tongue. They want to say something in a particular language. Hath a revelation and interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Make sure whatever you do, whatever you say, it's to build up the church, strengthen the church and their love for Jesus, not tear down. Now, pay attention, please. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. And that by course, meaning one at a time. And let one interpret. It's got to be interpreted so everyone understands and benefits. But if there be no interpreter, pay attention to the word silence. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. I want you, please, in Jesus' name, remember this word silence. It's the same word used for women. Okay? Same word used for women. In the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Now watch here. Let the prophet speak two or three. If you have prophets who want to proclaim... Two or three the most, right? Two or three the most, right? <clears throat> and let the other judge, if it's truly a prophetic word. If anything be revealed to another man, another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So if a man during that time is receiving revelation right there from the Spirit, the one speaking, be silent. Let this man stand up and speak because the Spirit's prompting him to speak, okay? For... Ye may all prophesy one by one, one at a time, that all may learn and be comforted. Okay, now 32 and 33. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You have control over that revelation, that ecstatic speech. It doesn't control you because the Holy Spirit gives you the strength to control it. So you don't add chaos and confusion, but <clears throat> promote unity and build up the body. Now notice 43. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. You see what the point is in the passage? Guys, you understand? 33 is the key. The point in the passage is we want orderly worship. God is not a God of confusion. He doesn't cause people to speak out of turn, speak different languages that no one understands. So it's chaos and confusion, and no one gets built up. He's not a God of chaos, of disorder. He's a God of peace. This is the context. This is the context. Let's read 34, 35, and we'll post it one more time. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Did it originate from you? Or came it unto you only? Or are you the only one that receives the word of God? Okay, let's read 33 one more time. 
33, one more time. Read it. For God is not the author of confusion, meaning chaos, disorder, division. That's what the word means. But a peace of order, of unity, as in all the churches of the saints. Is it clear what the context is now? Is it clear what the context is? The context is about a church in chaos and disorder, people speaking out of turns, speak, people speaking in tongues, no one understanding, women disrupting the service by asking questions out of turn and causing chaos and confusion. Is it clear, guys, or no? <clears throat> I just want to make sure. Are you getting it? Is it clear to everyone? Because I'm almost done with 1 Corinthians 14. Almost done. As long as you're getting it, go back to part two. Praise Jesus. The first 37 minutes saved, nothing lost. And this will be part 2B. You got to listen to all these sessions. So what's the point of Paul? Paul is addressing a specific need, <clears throat> plaguing a specific church at a specific location. In this church, people were speaking in tongues out of turn and no one interpreting so that the rest could not understand. So they were not being built up. In this church, people were standing up and speaking out of turn, causing chaos, confusion, and no one was being edified. In this church, there were married women. Married women speaking out of turn, asking questions, adding to disruption and confusion, not promoting unity and peace and understanding. That's the context. Okay, now the word silence used. Silence. Let's see what it is. There you go. Here it is. Let me give you the link. Is it making sense to everyone before I move on? Is it making sense? If someone's confused, ask me. So Cindy Gullian, notice what you said. Sounds like some of the church you've been to. That means now 1 Corinthians 14 applies to them. Though it was written to the Corinth, it still has meaning for us today because we still need to follow that orderly structure of worship. So the whole Bible is for all Christians in all generations until the Lord returns. But it was written to specific communities with specific needs. See, thank you, Sharon DeCruz. You see now why 1 Corinthians 14 would apply to your situation. Because unfortunately, nothing new under the sun. And in every generation of Christians, we still have carnal-minded infants or unbelievers and sheep's clothing coming and creating chaos, bringing division, destroying the order of the church. So 1 Corinthians 14 is still applicable and must be enforced. Clear? Brother Bass, you don't like it, get lost. Stop barking. I thought you blocked this power. He just said he's leaving. But again, like an agent of Satan, like a dog, he has to disrupt. See, you are just proof you're being used to disrupt, you dog. Disgraceful. What's disgraceful is your arrogance. Okay. Okay, here you go. Thank you, Court. Click on that link and go there with me. Click on that link and go there with me. Hopefully, in Jesus' name, pray for me by the power of the Spirit. From now on, I'm going to be blocking every disruption so they don't add to confusion and chaos. Notice he just did what 1 Corinthians 14 said should not be done. In his wicked, vile arrogance, he wants to be heard and get attention, causing disruption. In Jesus' name, no more. Just block right away. We want to make this channel as God-honoring as possible. And we're going to get rid of the weeds, the dogs, and the agents of Satan. Okay, now. Click on this. Click on it again. Go and see that the same Greek word used by Paul to say, women, be silent. Okay. Be silent. That same Greek word, right, is used in verse 28 and 30. 
verses 28 and 30. So now, do me a favor. Protestant believer, post 1 Corinthians 14, 28. 1 Corinthians 14, 30, and 1 Corinthians 14, 34. It's the same Greek word, segao, segao, segao. Now let's read. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence. Notice what Paul is saying. You will speak in tongues. If no one interprets, be silent. Same word, 1 Corinthians 14, 30. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth, but let the first hold his peace. Let the first be silent. So the one who is prophesying, be silent. And now, what does it say about the woman? Let your woman keep silence in the church. See, same thing. You speaking in tongues. Be silent if you don't have someone interpreting. You who happen to be prophesying. If someone receives a revelation right there, be silent. Let him speak. You marry women. Be silent. Now, does this mean that Paul is saying married women cannot contribute anything in the church or is he speaking in the context of married women disrupting the church and promoting chaos and confusion and he says be silent don't ask a question and disrupt the service ask your husbands at home and they'll clarify so paul is no more forbidding women from speaking as he's forbidding prophets from prophesying, as he's forbidding people who speak in tongues to speak in tongues publicly. You hear me there? Let me repeat it again. Paul is no more forbidding married women from speaking in the church as he's preventing prophets from prophesying in the church, as he's preventing people. Ah, oh, this buffering. Yeah, I'm sure you follow this. Okay, in Jesus' name, I finish this session for his glory. Please pray, I find a place, get better internet connection, and do pray for the financial provision. The way I'm going, I'm going to have nobody to be supporting the ministry, right? So pray for that so I can continue to be and take care of the, my children, right? Okay, let's see. Okay, so Paul, again, let me repeat. I like to repeat myself more than once until it seeks in for the glory of Jesus. Paul is no more saying married women can say nothing in the church, then he's saying that prophets can't say anything in the church or those speaking in tongues have to be silent in the church. That's not his point. You understand what the point is now? You understand what the point is now? The point is there's a particular group of married women causing disruption and confusion in the church at Corinth, adding to chaos and confusion as our prophet speaking out of turn and one prophet not respecting the other prophet who's receiving a fresh revelation at that moment by the spirit to share and just sitting back and letting that person speak or people speaking in tongues without interpreting and therefore edifying no one that's what he's address addressing that women can pray and prophesy in the church that married woman, married woman, can pray and prophesy in the church, again, is confirmed by 1 Corinthians 11. Are we ready now for the icing of the cake to settle this issue once and for all, to know what women can and cannot do in the church? Are we ready now? That Paul in the same epistle, that same letter, that same epistle, shows that married woman can pray and prophesy and therefore speak in the local body and don't have to be silent. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 10. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 10. Watch here. And then I'll open up to other questions and other points and I'll be done. I don't know why you put 34. Protestant, you're really killing me. And you're really tempting me to smash your face in and repent. Why would you put 34, brother? Can you come near me so I can lay hands on you, bro? You're not getting, getting paid nothing for nothing. So 1 Corinthians 11, 3 to 10, you put 34. 
Okay. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Pay attention now. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Right? But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. If she's going to pray without a covering, then let her just shave her head. It's the same thing if her head was shaved. She was bald. Now watch this. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. If for if a woman not be not covered, let her also be shorn. Verse 6. If she's not going to cover, let her shorn her head. Let her shave her head. But if it be a shame, a disgrace for a woman to be shorn, to be bald, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Now, if you want to understand what Paul meant, did mean, listen to yesterday's session. I provided an in-depth exegesis of Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy 2. I don't want to repeat it again. So by the grace of the Lord Jesus, yesterday's session covers what he meant here. But let's continue. Verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now, verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Obviously, he's talking about husbands and wives here. Because a man is not the head of every woman. In other words, I am not the head of Protestant's wife. I am not the head of first and last mother. So when he says the man is the head of the woman, he's talking about husbands and wives. A husband is the head of his wife. And a wife must honor her head, her husband, by having a sign of submission. That she recognizes her submission to her husband. And she's in full compliance to what God has commanded of her. Submit to your husband. And as a sign of her compliance. A sign that she is in submission and she accepts what God's will is for her. Is that with me? Sylvia. Go back to yesterday's session and I explain what the covering is. The covering would be her long hair. And so this is referring to husbands and wives. Did everyone understand in the context, Paul is not saying, I'm the head of every woman on the planet. I'm the head of every man's wife. I'm the head of every man's mother. I'm the head of every man's daughter. And every man is the head of every other. You get my, he's not saying this. He's saying the husband is the head of his wife. And the wife is in submission to her husband. You understand what the context is, right? Do you understand what the context is? Because who is he referring to? Adam and Eve. In 1 Corinthians 11, 7 to 8, he's speaking of Adam and Eve. That Eve was created for Adam, came out of Adam. And Adam was the husband of Eve. He was her head. It's talking about husbands and wives and their relationship to each other. Is that clear? Are you getting the point? Before I move on. If someone's confused, say I'm confused, I'm not getting it. In other words, Paul is not making a blanket statement saying, I am the head of Protestant believers' wife. I am the head of Billy Mandley's wife. No. That's not what he's saying. That's an abomination. I cannot be the head over someone else's mother, someone else's wife, someone else's sister, someone else's daughter. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about each man is the head of his own family, his own wife, his own daughter, his, you know, well, not, he's not the head of his sister. No, he's not the head of his sister. His father's the head of his sister. You get the point, right? Is it clear as day, and there's no way around this, by the grace of the triune God, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no way around this. You sure you're getting it? Can I let's read 11 to 16? Jesus is the head of every creature, but in this order, he is the head of the man, and he's appointed the man to be the head of his wife, And both of them are the head of their household with the woman in submission to the man who's in submission to Christ, who's in submission to the Father. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 and 16. Let's read, guys. 
Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Though Eve came from man, now all men come out of women. Neither the woman without the man and the Lord. We both need one another and we cannot exist apart from each other. And both of us depend on the, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, for everything we are, for everything we need, everything we have. Now let's continue reading. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely befitting that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Should, should a woman pray uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man hath long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, wants to argue with us, disagree, let him realize we have no such custom besides this one that I'm articulating in this letter by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? <clears throat> Neither do the churches of God. Folks, can I ask you a question? Does God expect and command married women to pray? Or do married women not pray and they just shut up, sit there and be mute? Is it the duty of married women to pray to God, to sing to God, to worship God, and to even teach specifically their own children? If that's the case, then 1 Corinthians 11 is clearly teaching women who are married can pray and prophesy like men. Husbands pray and prophesy, and their wives pray and prophesy. So Paul is not saying that women who are married cannot pray, cannot prophesy. They must pray and prophesy, like men must pray and prophesy, and together they can pray and prophesy. But wait, if that's what Paul is saying, then is Paul contradicting himself in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says married women remain silent in the churches? Here, let's post them now back to back. Let's post them back to back. Protestant, post 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5, with 34 and 35. First Corinthians 14, verses 34, 35, 11, 5. Now read together to see why skeptical scholars, liberal scholars, and don't believe the Bible's consistent, think that verses 34 and 35 were inserted by a later scribe because they think this contradicts what Paul said. No. Not 1 Corinthians 14, 35, Protestant believer. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. You're going to really lose your job, and I'm not going to pay you anymore, even though I pay you nothing. But God bless you for serving. All right, hold on. Buffering. Buffering. You and David would give me a taste of purgatory. Okay, let's try it again, brother. Sorry about that. 1 Corinthians, 4, 1 Corinthians 11, 5 and 40, 14, 34, 35. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue for your glory. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5 and 14, 34, 35. Well, if you're not a church person, then you're not a Bible person either. But every man that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, every woman, Lord Jesus, protect me from her. Holy Spirit, fill me to glorify Jesus Christ and bless the church. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. But then notice 34, 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, guys, I'm confused. Um, hello, I didn't care if you're a woman. You'll get muzzled too if you keep talking stupidly. Okay, pay attention here. Paul says women who are married can pray and prophesy as long as their head is covered. But then in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 says, women be silent in the church and ask your husbands. Is that a contradiction? Help me understand what's going on here. No, it has nothing to do with saying opposite of the husband or speaking out of turn. You're confusing two different contexts. How can Paul say women pray and prophesy as long as they're covered, rec showing their recognition and compliance with their submission to the authority of God as said over them? If elsewhere he says women be silent altogether. You with me there? 
You understand what's going on? Because for a woman to pray, she can't be silent in the church. For a woman to prophesy, prophesying, the Greek word means to proclaim, proclaiming the word of God. How can she proclaim God's word in the church? How can she pray if she's to be altogether silent? So either Paul is contradicting himself, and Zarina, I don't think Zarina got it. Zarina, you're confusing me. What in the world are you talking about? If a woman is going to pray in the church and prophesy in the church, that means she's speaking aloud in the public congregation. She's not silent. How are you saying her husband speaks for her? Okay. So let's try this again. Let's try this again. For married women to pray and prophesy, that means they are speaking in the church Speaking aloud in mixed company in the congregation. So how can married women be completely silent? What's the answer, folks? Court, count rhythm, Tony, now that you're getting it. What's the answer, folks? It's not complicated. You don't need to be a PhD to get it. Think about it. I just spent about an hour explaining the context for Corinthians 14. Please don't tell me it was a waste of my time. God forbid. If Paul says married women can pray and prophesy in the church, there's no problem. As long as they have a sign of authority that they're in full compliance with the structure that God has set and their submission to their husbands. That means they can't be silent because they're going to have to speak aloud when they're praying and prophesying. Then how can he say in 1 Corinthians 14, women be silent, ask your husbands at home. Let's see who got it. If you don't get it, I'm going to block every one of you and I'm going to look for a new group of Christians who get it. Thank you, Akaisha. No, Sylvia, you didn't get it either. Akaisha, you've given me hope for humanity. It was only to specific women that were causing disruption. Thank you, Shirley and Akaisha. Were you even listening?